programs is being presented to help all of us understand better our advantage, our American way of life. For today's topic, let's join now a group of young people at the National Education Program Workshop, Arkansas. At the classroom lectern is Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr., noted young historian. We have discussed socialism and communism in our last two classroom sessions. Now, founder and director of the National Education Program says that if each generation of Americans will develop a clear understanding of our American system of capitalism, how it works, and the comparative advantages it produces for all citizens, then neither socialism nor communism ever will become established in America. So let's see if we can develop a better understanding of capitalism. But first, who will define for us the term capital? That is, in its economic sense. All right, Joan, suppose you define it for us. Well, uh, money. Capital's money. That's right, but only partially right. Let me demonstrate. Here is a dime. Suppose I take this dime and buy some ceramic clay. Now then my money, which is capital, has been converted into raw material, which it logically follows must also be capital. I mold this clay into a child's toy animal. You would regard the energy expended by me as capital. Now when I finish, I bake this clay toy in my oven at home. This oven, or any machine I might use in achieving the final product, must also be regarded as capital. Then I add the final touch and sell this toy for 39 cents, or at least I try to. And if I should succeed, I take the 39 cents, reinvest it in clay, and start the cycle again employing again all the farms which capital may take as raw materials, as energy, as machine, and so on. Capital, in a few words, is money at work producing things. And since I am in charge of the cycle, I am a capitalist. Yes? Well, what if you have to borrow that money like so many businesses do to start that cycle? Then that makes the lender a capitalist too, since it is his money at work producing something and he becomes a part of the cycle. Capitalism is a system in which economic wealth or capital is used to produce goods for sale, or in other words, to produce new wealth. But Professor Gaines, aren't there different kinds of capitalism? Yes, there are, and the differences can be vitally important. State capitalism is often the first stage of socialism. We might say that state capitalism exists when the government achieves a combination of ownership and control in business and industry large enough to permit it to dominate the nation's economy. And there are forms of capitalism in which production and distribution are governed by cartels or monopolies, fixing prices and permitting no competition. This form existed in many European countries in the time of Karl Marx and during this century before socialism or communism gained control. Yes, John, an important fact that we must emphasize is that American capitalism is quite unique. There never has been a system quite like it in all history. So let's examine the structure of American capitalism. There are three great pillars. The first and foremost of these is who can tell us? All right, Louise. Isn't it the principle of private ownership of property? Yes, it is. This principle of private ownership is undoubtedly the most fundamental element in the structure of American capitalism. Consider, for instance, home ownership, which is a bright American goal for most of our people. The desire to own one's own home, one's own property, provides a real incentive for almost all Americans to bring out their most productive efforts. In the American system, what's yours is yours. 
What you do with it is your business. You can squander it away or you can work harder and produce more and have more. The principle of the private ownership of property is the number one target of the socialist and communist. They believe in government ownership and control. Karl Marx in the Communist Manifesto wrote, the theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence, abolition of private property. So private property is the foremost pillar supporting the American system and our personal freedom. That brings us to the second great pillar. Who can tell us what it is? All right, Mary. The profit motive. Yes, indeed. This is the stimulus that brings private ownership to life and expands its usefulness to society as a whole. In one sense, profit is property. When an individual produces more than the basic living requirements for himself and his family, the surplus is profit, which he can use as he sees fit. An automobile is not a basic requirement for survival, nor is a television set. Yet most American families want them and have them because all normal human beings want more than the bare necessities of existence. The capitalistic principle of private ownership gives them the privilege of earning and keeping enough wealth beyond their food and shelter requirements to afford to buy the other things they want. But Professor Gaines, what about the individual who doesn't produce a product of his own? What I mean is, what about the employee, the worker? Well, you remember we said that energy is capital. Ability is capital. When we as employees work for someone else, we're not selling our time, we're selling our services, our ability. When we get paid, if we save a little of our income, we are profiting. And we can become employers if we wish and if we can develop management capabilities. Many of America's greatest industrialists were employees who saved and developed their capabilities. If we do not develop into employers, we still can become producers or capitalists by investing our surplus, our savings, in some enterprise which is producing something. 18 million ordinary Americans own stock in businesses and industries. If I borrowed money from you to make my clay toys, you would become producers, since your capital would help produce my toys. The business world is full of actual examples. General Motors, for instance, is just a group of people who with their dimes and dollars are producing products for sale. There are more than half a million stockholders with their savings invested in General Motors. And why do they invest their dimes and dollars? They want to make a profit. It is a normal, wholesome motivation. Dr. Gaines, I once heard a clergyman say that the profit motive is not a good motive. Do you agree with him? I'm sure the clergyman wasn't a socialist or communist, but that happens to be what the socialist and communist say about the profit motive. And yet, most converts to socialism and communism joined up because of the promise of personal benefit or profit. Would a clergyman be able to fill his church if he told prospective members that there is no personal reward or profit in giving one's life to God? How many of you students study at dinner each evening instead of having the momentary pleasure of some favorite pastime? I think you would want to say that study can be work. What motivates you then? A desire for learning, a desire perhaps for good grades, but with the belief that in the end you will render a more valuable service and receive more for it. If you didn't hope to profit, you wouldn't study. What I'm trying to say is that the profit motive is active in most human behavior. That's important to remember. And now to the third of the three great pillars in American capitalism. All right, Gary. The open market. Yes, the open competitive market, where anyone can offer his wares for sale at whatever price he can get, is a benefit not only to business and industry, but to the individual as well. Let's go back to our toy animal illustration. Let's suppose that we develop an ability to make attractive little ceramic toys, and that children all the nation want these toys. We expand our enterprise, probably on borrowed money, and begin making profit. 
Another toy manufacturer, seeing our ceramic toys cutting into his sales and profit, does some research and finds that he can make an unbreakable toy very much like ours and sell it for less money than we're getting, at the same time making a profit. He can do this because we have a free, competitive market in America, challenging achievement. The consumer or buyer gains when we have this constant competition in the marketplace. The best products at the lowest cost emerge. Have you ever seen one of the early automobiles manufactured in America? It was really something to behold. When it was manufactured, only a few wealthy people could own an automobile. And even for them, it was likely to break down on any 10-mile trip. Today, there are more automobiles in America than there are families. And almost every family owns one. Competition, the free market, brought this about. Henry Ford was determined to outstrip other manufacturers. He went after the mass market with his low-price Model T, produced with his remarkable mass production techniques. He won the low-price market, but not for long. Others competed, and competed so well that the product continued constantly to improve. What competition in the free market has done in the production of automobiles, it has done for thousands of other things. With private ownership of property, the profit motive, and the competitive free market, American capitalism produces more wealth than the next 10 nations all combined. You and I benefit tremendously because of our great productive system, American capitalism. Our individual efforts bring us rewards higher than those realized by any people on the earth. With one day's wages, an American, for example, can buy this big supply of food. An Englishman's daily wage, by contrast, will buy only this much. And a Russian's, just this much. So let's remember these pillars of freedom and progress when we hear or see the socialist or the communist trying openly or secretly to undermine them. These factors can be destroyed through subversion or through our own short-sightedness or apathy in defending them. Surely all of us can feel gratitude and pride toward American capitalism. Its record of improving human welfare is unmatched in all history. Next week, we shall examine American capitalism's widespread distribution of wealth. Until then, class dismissed. The American Adventure Series is a production of the National Education Program, Searcy, Arkansas, Dr. George S. Benson, Director. Dr. Clifton L. Gaines, Jr. was our instructor. This is a continuing series based on the unique political and economic system which has made America great. Watch for the next presentation of the American Adventure.